Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. My name's Paul John Dykes. I'm Kevin Graham. And today we're joined by James English. Welcome to Stirling, James. Thanks for having us, lads. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, to be honest. We've got lots to talk about. Yes. Lots to talk about. James is what I would say is a multi-talented individual. I've known James through playing for the Celtic Greats, which I certainly am not. <laughs> but some <laughs> of the guys on the field are ex-Celtic players, and it's a great charity thing that we do every six weeks or so. And he's a natural guest for this show because he's got a Celtic state of mind and he's got something to talk about he's got a few things to talk about so James let's go back to your youth talk about your your upbringing your childhood and what kind of things do you think about back then that have shaped you into the guy you are today uh, my upbringing was tough I was coming from a po- place called Postle Park which is a very rough area in Glasgow uh, mum and dad never had much just basically struggling family grew up in a tough school grew up in a tough area and you kind of just have to survive for yourself it's um it's like a jungle, basically. But, again, everything that I'd done through there and learned through there, like I say, has shaped me to be the man I am today. But it wasn't an easy journey, a journey of drink, drugs, gambling, womanising, a lot of bad stuff, a lot of stuff I'm not proud of. But, like I say, I accepted that I took responsibility. Instead of pointing fingers, then I took charge. And, like I say, I channel everything that I've learnt to the path I'm on the now. I think that's what makes it so interesting when you watch some of the material that you've produced and we'll talk about particularly the the homeless documentary that you made, James, which I I told you this when I met you in Glasgow. I'd watched it the previous night and it had me in tears. It had me in tears, but what you were doing there is very much you were helping people. And one of the guests, and we'll we'll cross back and forward on your podcast show, was one of the guys in that, that documentary who, if you'd asked me where is he now, you would have thought the guy's dead. Uh But he was able to turn his life around So do you get a sense of the fact that you got an insight Into all these demons or all these things That can really detract from you as a person and your talent And the fact you were able to turn it around That you can maybe help people that are in scenarios That are very difficult to get out of Definitely, like I say Everybody's human beings We're caught up in a world of materialism Fame, money If I'm honest, it's all bullshit It's the real welfare of a person How much good you do in the world And I believe that And like I say, I battled a lot of my demons, which I still battle every day. So I know how fast it is to really slip down that slope. So people forget when you're homeless, they've once run a business, they've got families, they've got kids. Just certain circumstances can put you on the streets. And I was blessed that I could get a piece of anybody's door. I was a widow, I was a fly man, so I always knew I was going to be all right. But a lot of people have not got that confidence. So if I'm gambling, losing all my money, I could always get money. I could always I'd make people laugh, I'd make people feel sorry for me. And I just had that gift, and for some some people they've not got that, where they end up homeless and then they end up slipping into drinking drugs and bad habits. Like I say, I know a lot of people with money out there, it's got everything in life that are addicted to drugs. So when you're homeless, disconnected from the world, as it's like a world within a world, it's, you don't feel as if anybody cares, so it's easy to get caught up in that. But you actually, like I say, I spent seven days in the streets, I, I grew a rapport, I grew trust, and we'd done as much as we could to get people help, the guy Stuart, if I'm honest, was the worst in the documentary. He was on the street for years, addicted to drugs for years, abused mentally, physically. The guy changed his life and now he's helping homeless people. So it shows that people can change. All you need is that spark, that light bulb moment that you can make changes. And everybody's got it. It doesn't matter how messed up your, your life is or how old you are. Anybody can make changes, but you must believe it. And it takes time as well to change. But as long as you take that first step, then it can lead you into the life that you want or deserve. What I loved is you said I could get a piece at any door. <laughs> you know, I actually remember going to a door for a piece in back in my youth. That's what you did. You were out playing all day. Uh-huh. And you could chap somebody's door and get a drinky uh-huh. juice and a sandwich normally with jam on it or something. Jam, butter we had. But uh, <laughs> it was a luxury when you get jam. Somebody must have got a win at the bingo or something when it, was, when it was jam. So going back to that, obviously you found yourself as a young guy, you were a talented football player. I've seen you in action playing now, the age you are now. You had a talent for football and that was identified. How did your football career develop? F- football was a... Uh, that was my get-out. 
Football's always my get. I always had. I was always gifted. I had speed, naturally speed. Like I say, went to old Celtic matches for ages of four, and that's where I found my passion. I remember my first day, uh, first game. I think it was against Dundee Parkhead in the old stands, and I just kind of fell in love with it then. And then played with a team called Postal YM, and if I'm honest, I ran amok. I was like I say, confident. I've still got that confident cocky call it whatever what you want, but I've still kind of got that. But nine, ten, eleven, get picked up. With, picked up with Hibs at eleven. Played with them for five years, but I was a jack the lad. I thought I knew everything. I knew F O man. I, 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 I knew nothing. And like I say, when I signed my S form, I was playing for Hibs. I was telling all the women I played for the first team. <laughs> I was only playing under 16s, under 18s. And then obviously, I, I was a good looking boy. I was funny. And then at the drink, and then I got involved with the drugs. And that's when things started getting serious. And that's when you always think you're going to make it. But it's no matter how much ability you've got, it's dedication. It's always dedication and commitment. I never had that because, like I say, I thought I knew everything. I always thought I would make it as well. But, like I say, it goes for like Hibs. And then I went to Partick first one night, went to Queen's Park. Then I went junior and then I went amateur. And before you know it, you're 23, 24 and you've kind of chucked it. Mm-hmm. So that's when, like I say, I get involved in heavier drugs and then the gambling and then life spiral for about 10 years. It's kind of a blur. You know, I've spoken to some players who find it difficult I know that you, you mentioned a list of teams there, Hibs, Thistle, Queen's Park, but you are, if you're a footballer, you get a lot of attention. So you're going to get guys who would love to be in your position, and you're going to get girls, you're going to get that attention as well. When the football goes, is that quite difficult as well, that all that kind of superstardom and that attention, that disappears as well? Of course, and I wouldn't even say it was superstardom there, it was just more getting attention. When you grow up in post, you don't get much attention, because people just judge that place as a shite hole, which they've got a right to. But it doesn't mean you're a bad person. I always say it, the five people you surround yourself with is the five people you become. So if you're surrounded with drink, drugs or violence, it becomes a norm. It became normal for me. I, like I say, I grew up with people taking drink and drugs, but I never started until 16, 17. And then you get the buzz for it and it kind of takes you away from your pain and the misery that you see when you're younger. So when your attention goes, you kind of still crave it. So it's difficult. But one, like I say, and then you start realising my life's going nowhere. And that's when depression kicks in and that's when... The more drugs you take, the more alcohol to numb the pain that your life's going nowhere because it's escapism at the end of the day. You're just hiding from the fact that you could have been great or the fact that you could have made changes. And like I say, everything I've done, I've got to thank everything I've done in the past. Like I say, I don't regret it. Sometimes you wake up with regret, but I've got to kind of thank it because I'm trying to rectify everything and, and make it better, better myself and make people proud and show that people can change. That's the, the main objective for me is to show that Anybody can change, and I believe that I'm going to make changes. I have made changes, and I believe I'm just going to... I'm going to be a leader amongst men. I believe I'm going to take the, the bull with the horns and show people what can be done, just with vision. Like I say, everything I've achieved now is just be vision, work ethic and belief system. And it took me 34 years of just reading so many self-help books. I've got a house full of self-help books. <laughs> just try to re-educate myself and rewire the brain and understand it. Like I say, the brain, because all the addictions, if I do something once, I'm hooked. So if I st- this is the first time I've stayed on a good path and I'm hooked to this because mm-hmm. it's a natural buzz, natural chemicals. Listen, we've all got depression, we've all battled demons, but this is the first time in my life that it makes sense to me. This is this is what I'm here for. Do you think that any of the clubs that you played with could have done anything different with you? I think, like I say, it's, it's difficult, but there's not really any role models. There's not anybody you can really look up to and you, you kind of want to be with them. But a lot of the players have got the bookies and that as well, which is difficult. And you see a lot of them drinking and eating crisps after the, their diets were terrible so there was no anybody you really looked up to and go I want to aspire to be that was no what, what year was this? you're talking about 2000 1999 2000 2001 and that was without like social media and that then mm-hmm. so social media has just made it hard for a lot of the younger ones as well because we're constantly trying to compete so when you're, you kind of nobody really took you under your wing John Partner they were amazing the, the, like I say their youth system is brilliant house, but there was nobody really seen the telltale signs that because we used to go out on a Thursday night and a Sunday night and get going pushed at training nobody really you could cover it well there's no really about the you look at managers like Sir Alex Ferguson and that they kind of it's, it's their man management of players they can understand what the players are going through where it's happy sad they, they bring the best out in players I think sometimes you can be left on your own it's a lonely time listen to leave mm-hmm. Post all that and go and stay in Edinburgh, it's difficult because, like I say, when you're lonely, that's when you go and do daft things to keep your time busy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point about the bookies, for example. There's a massive culture in Scottish football, probably football elsewhere. Anybody I ever played with who ended up signed, their, their day, their work, their shift was finished midday, early afternoon, and they would go to the bookies because 
the, the senior pros would do that and they would do that as you say you could you could go for a drink and get away with it and if the senior pros are doing it and it's part of the culture of Scottish football then the young guys can get caught up in it do you think we're maybe moving away from that it's a good point Kevin makes that the club do anything different could they have done anything different we're still seeing it though we're still seeing it with high profile footballers even at Celtic where whatever the issues may be are obviously affecting these professions I think the younger players now um, I've got a you mentioned social media there, James. Eh? Uh-huh. Social media is a, a massive pressure. You look at some of the, the young younger players now who have got they're getting called a eh, content creators for Adidas, Puma, whoever they've signed a sponsorship deal with. There's a couple of Man United players who are actually signed to Jay Z's PR. Aye. So th- th- they're no football players. They are actual. They're pop royalty. They, uh-huh. they're, they're getting treated as pop stars. Uh-huh. So you, you've maybe got a guy who's just got talent, but he could be a bit messed up. Uh-huh. And he's getting thrust into this limelight uh-huh. at 19, 20, getting put on social media uh-huh. and stuff like that. Eh? And the clubs have got to handle that. Mm-hmm. I if, think so. I, like I say, it's not just about talent. It comes down from mental health issues. Yeah. And like I say, a lot of these people have got too much time and come from a rough area. Like I say, you speak about, you can see Lee Griffiths and that, and he talks about his mental health, but again, it's the addiction problems that stem from the gambling, because when you gamble as well, it releases a thing in your brain called dopamine. I've spoken it many times in my own podcast. Dopamine's my equivalent to heroin. So when your life doesn't feel that good, when you're gambling, you're buzzing. You've got that buzz, chemical buzz, where you're feeling amazing. So when that bet goes, the buzz goes. So that's where the constant addiction comes, because you're constantly craving that, craving that buzz. And like I say, these football players are getting a lot of attention, so they're getting mega money. Some of them don't know what to do, but it's money management as well to balance that mm-hmm. right and channel that into good areas. It's not just, like I say, it's not just about having a talent. There should be some doing how to manage money, how to mentally be strong. I believe everybody concentrate, a lot of people concentrate on the things they've not got instead of the things they have got, which is a f- difficult thing. We always want more and more and more. But it's a, the other things in life that makes you actually appreciate life. There's not enough gratitude in my eyes. If you've got more gratitude, then I think your life becomes more balanced. I think a lot of people just see money uh, solves everything. Mm-hmm. And when you've seen it with some of the reaction to Lee Griffiths and they go, why is he like that? He's got everything. And you're going, well, he's a human being. Yeah. Money just doesn't make mm-hmm. everything all better. It can actually sometimes make it worse. worse. I think I can, I can you're right. It it's always been there. Kevin, you th- remember Viduka signed? George Connolly. Yeah, and they disappear from the, the public face of mm-hmm. uh, being a footballer for a period or forever in some cases. It's, it's great to talk about it because I think previously we were very naive in respect to mental health and, and football because, mm-hmm. as Kevin says, oh, how, what have they got to moan about, you know? But it's, it's interesting to get that insight from you. I mean, when you realised maybe in your early 20s football wasn't going to be your career, you've obviously tried a few other things and you've now managed to create something from scratch mm-hmm. that is getting bigger and better than the guests that you've had on James English show Anything Goes how did this come about What? where, where did that idea come I from just um, as you know I like talking so when I was like I say when I changed my life I changed my life at 30 I wrote everything down that I needed to change drink, drugs, gambling womanising and people say oh it's alright doing that it's not because you're playing with people's feelings and emotions as well I was so in a dark place that I was doing all that stuff to fill a void but it never it made me a hundred times worse so I really disconnected from everybody I wrote it all down what I needed to do to change and I done it I done it for nearly two years but I went to America I was got to do motivational speaking and uh, I was doing a, a personal training course so I ended up we had to come back because my auntie died so I ended up having a void at her funeral as well and I thought I would be strong enough, but then I, everything I'd worked for, I'd, I kind of just went up and smoked because I ended up going off the rails for a year again. As fast as that, just having that one drink, that one drink led to me free, out for three days and then before you know it was back to the old James. Thankfully and luckily, I'm back on the path. It never took as, lo- as long to get back on the path because I knew how good I felt and I knew the stuff I was achieving. Like I say, I've got kids. I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to pretend... And even the words I'm speaking, as only words, actions speak louder than words. So now I came on this path and I watched a lot of podcasts and, like I say, a lot of self-help stuff. And I says, I can do that. And the plan was to just go with it. Like I say, anything goes, I've been there and done it. I don't want to just stick to one thing. I believe I'm versatile. I can sit with nuns. I can sit with gangsters. I can sit with anybody. And I'll get an understanding of them. I can read people well. And we started that. I came up, I came up with an idea and we started it one episode and now we're 34 deep. But... Like I say, it's grown arms and legs, it's getting bigger and better. And last year was to do the groundwork, build the platform. This is the first time I've ever really stuck to anything without quitting. I was always a quitter, I always, always quit. When things started getting hard, I quit. But like I say, reading a lot of books and a lot of self-help stuff, I realised that 99% of success is failure. I'm going to keep failing. When things got hard for me, I turned my back and walked away. 
because that's what I've done. But now, like I say, I've found my feet and I'm, I really thoroughly enjoy this something that I love speaking to people, including yourselves, guys. Your podcast is absolutely amazing. I listen to it all the time, and you should be proud of what you are doing. Oh, thanks because for that. Thanks. You, the guest the caliber I guess you are getting is is second to none, including myself. So he must be doing all right. <laughs> uh, so, like I say, the plan was last year to build the, the groundwork, get the platform built, which is done. People are starting to take note. This year again, like I say, is to become one of the biggest in the UK. But next year. I'll be the biggest a confident cocky I says it before but it is but it is and later I say I've got to be because for years I've been a failure if I'm honest it's on a, an upward trajectory and I, I tune in as I say I watch a documentary which we'll talk about separately which had me in tears you watch the interviews you do a lot of it is really I mean some of the stories are quite harrowing talking about drugs and gangs and this kind of thing James but there is a curiosity you want to hear mm -hmm. the stories and I think you tap into that what's some of the favourite guests you've had some of the favourite moments and stories I do like the I love the my good boy, good boy Jed Neal was a, was a cracker Jed was um, in and out prison for a long time and totally transformed his life started understanding the brain and it makes a lot of sense but like I say I've had good, um, like Tommy Sheridan who was a nutcase Methadone Mick like I say a lot of gangsters but it's people want to hear these stories and I don't glorify these people because everybody's we've all got a past we all make mistakes and a lot of people are conditioned into that life it's no easy for people to say oh he's a bad person this and that anybody that does bad really want to change but it's hard because 95% of your days control your subconscious so a lot of people are robotic to the stuff they do and they don't really understand that to be honest every guest has been different every guest has been different I don't sit with questions I just roll with it and I, I make it work like I said I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird, dominatrix. Dominatrix, porn Anybody stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you seen that one, Kevin? I haven't, yeah. actually, no. James goes into the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Honestly, there should be a certificate on that one. <laughs> <laughs> there should be, I think that's a 30 certificate, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, the dominatrix, a girl who, like I say, people have got crazy fetishes, and they go to her to deal with these fetishes, and she's got a dungeon, and yeah, it's, uh, but like I say, everybody's got a story, and I can't judge because I've done some crazy shit in my time so it's uh, I got a better understanding with these people for some reason I connect and I get it like I say it's, we all judge and we all sit there and listen I was laughing the whole way through because it is crazy and it's scary I was scared I didn't know if I was getting back <laughs> out there if I'm honest but uh, I know it's good and listen I love it and like I say this is only the beginning to something beautiful that I'm going to achieve Do you think you'll keep it on the platform James of YouTube because you see a lot of things even mainstream TV shows now there was one fairly recently that was on STV2 it now exists on a YouTube channel and with the correct sponsorship and views and advertising mm. you can survive doing that do you would you prefer to keep it on your own platform yeah I like to I don't want to be controlled I don't want to be uh, taking orders like I say a lot of people have been sniffing about me but I don't want to be watered down. I don't want to be edited because that's what I feel is going to happen. I want to stay true to myself. I don't know who I'll be in a year, two year. I just need to keep being me, keep working on me because if anyone else... Like I say, I can build this channel to anywhere I want it to go. I can take this anywhere around the world. I can create it into a chat show. I can do whatever. Like I say, once the, the name starts getting about, people are going to know the name and are going to know, do you know what? He's a good guy. I still make mistakes every day and there's things I'm... Like I say, I still do every day. I get angry, I get upset, but I'm human. But for me, just to keep on the straight path, people are enjoying it, so don't don't fix if it's not broken my eyes, and I'll just stick to this path. And like I say, I'm not going to take orders. I'm not going to get caught up in the mainstream media. Listen, if they come in and the money's right, trust me, I'll take it. But for me, I'm going to create this channel to things that only people... People don't think I could have achieved that. People say, why are you doing a podcast? This is why I'm doing it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's brilliant, and I'm meeting guys like yourself, and we always support each other, and I love that. There's no badness towards it. Anybody that's got good content, I will always share and retweet and always try and promote people because like I say it's like attracts like if you're being good and trying to be a better version of yourself then you're going to exactly attract that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the guests that you get as well might be put off if you go mainstream if you had a production company there mm -hmm. and you can get the gangsters and the dominatrixes mm -hmm. and that just now but if you went to an STV2 yeah. for example mm -hmm. they might be a bit no I'm no I'm not doing that eh? definitely they're, 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 still, they're still a bit of punk rock independence yeah. mm -hmm. about doing it there's yourself there's a bit of honest there yes because there's no agenda mm -hmm. when I see people getting upset and there's questions that I could ask it I know it's going to get publicity but I don't want to I pull back and I'll change the subject there's no agenda. I want people to be there and tell their story. There's always three sides to a story. There's always both sides and the truth in my eyes. Like I say, the people, a lot of people have been on the papers of actually, 
you could go suicidal with actually stuff some of the people have wrote and uh, it's good for them to get their story like I say there's no agenda for I feel I'm getting upset and then I'll change the subject straight away mm-hmm. because uh, it's not my place to keep the camera on when they're crying or they're upset it's, mm-hmm. I, I just want to be because if I get a good guest then word spreads he's a good guy He's a good guy, him, so yeah. it's easy for I'm me gonna to get... I'm going to try and stitch him. Yeah, up, get you know? better for... I can get more guests. Like yeah. I say, I'm trying to create a business from it. That's all I'm trying to do, and for me to do that, I've got to try and be honest with myself. Listen, obviously, I had guys like Andy Gorman. I've got to sit in the fence and, and be the best... I've got to be, do my job. Do you know what I mean? I'm not there to trip people up or accuse people of anything because that's not, that's not what I'm there to do. Mm-hmm. So, like I say, people want to come on the show now because... They know that it's a good platform for them to tell their story. Yeah, and they can be honest, James, because, I mean, Gorham had problems, McAvenny had issues. You spoke to Andy McLaren, it's one of the best episodes yet mm-hmm. uh, because, I mean, his journey was incredible and what a player Andy McLaren was. But he is now able to help others, isn't he? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the time when you listen to it, I listened to the Blink McDonald's, it was only like three hours. Three hours, yeah, mate. Three hours, and listening to the Blink McDonald's story, there's a, there's a part of that story where you think, what else is he going to do uh-huh. other than get back into crime? There was no other options for him. Uh-huh. And I think that's important because when we move on to your homeless documentary, which we'll talk about next, there's a stage in these people's lives where you think to yourself, drinking drugs, how, how can you criticise them for taking it? Whatever they need to get through the night, uh-huh. why, why should we criticise them? So your homeless documentary, again, it's on your YouTube channel. It's had an incredible amount of interest and views. And as I say, anybody who hasn't seen it, please do watch it. Did you record it a year last Christmas? Yeah, 2017. Mm-hmm. What 2000. was your thinking behind that? T- talk us through that journey. Um, I've always did my part. Like, I always try and help people as much as I can, but I was never to the extreme that I'd done there. Like I say, you get your wee sausage roll at Greg's and a wee pound and you think, oh, that's me. I've done my good deed for the week or the month. But for me, I ended up speaking to a man. I was down in London and I ended up speaking to a homeless man and I just got to know his story and he was just telling us that his wife committed suicide he was served his country for 18 years and uh, the kids blamed him for his wife's suicide because he wasn't there and the man was crying I was crying and it was just a couple of weeks before Christmas and I felt as if people need to see the stories people need to be more aware of actually how much pain people who sleep in the street are and I come up with the idea right I'm just going to go homeless myself for seven days and uh, no money no phone nothing I was on a spiritual journey so I told my friends and family I was going on a seven day fitness retreat so they kind of like that, yeah, because they know I'm kind of crazy. So they kind of just, OK, that's fine. And I just rolled with it. And I went 19th of December and I followed it. And the first two or three, the first day I was, I was, what am I doing? I just didn't, I, I, to this day, even though I knew what I was doing, it still felt weird why I'd done it as well. I, something, I don't know why I'd done the seven days. But I did, the first day I was, I don't know, it was just, it was cold and I was sleeping at a chapel doorway and I was like, I'm getting home. But then as two and three days come, then I started getting the confidence and the trust and started speaking to people. And then that's when you hear the, the horrific stories that people go through and you actually hear the stories that we're all connected and we're all as one. And we forget that. we're caught. So many people walk past homeless people and forget that somebody's son or daughter or brother or sister or even a friend. It's, it's tough, but like I say, we did it. A few people have passed away since the documentary. But we've also changed two lives, which is important. So yeah, I'm proud of it. Really proud of it. And it's uh I believe it's still it's going shown around schools now and prisons. I was down at a place called the Good Shepherd there on Wednesday, who it was a secure unit for children and they watched it. Now they're trying to make up like survival kits and stuff like that. I was up at All Saints School and the boys up there are doing things and what help homeless. So it's good. It makes people realise that your life's not that bad because we always love to moan and complain and mm. the majority is living luxury and we forget that and this kind of doesn't just make you look at homeless people differently it makes you look, question your own life it does it does has, has any politician or that tried to get on to you and says Glasgow City Council come to you or anything nah, they, like that they kind of like I say a lot of these people sweep it under the carpet because it's the truth it's um, like I say there was a couple of mainstream channels that wanted it but they wanted to half it in two they wanted to do other scenes outside it to say this help was getting done and that was getting done but I trusted that he just put it out there because mm-hmm. it's there and that is what it is my gut feeling was saying just put it out myself because I'm not touching it because that's the real story of what it's like to actually be homeless and I was mm-hmm. only homeless for seven days I put weight on for the seven days I was homeless because there's so much generosity from people so much goodness in the world we don't hear about it there's like I say a lot of people was offering food a lot of soup kitchens but it doesn't change the fact that your low in confidence, your low in self esteem, you've been abused. Everything's a mindset. Mm-hmm. So, like I say, we're trying to come up with a 12 week system where, while we're in this 12 week system, we can change the full mindset. I believe it takes 21 days to break a habit and 21 days to create a new one. 
like I say, if 95% of your day is controlled by your subconscious, so if you're homeless and doing the same shit day in, day out, you're going to repeat that cycle until you eventually break it. When you do something new, it feels uncomfortable. So if you feel uncomfortable for that 21 days, no matter what it is, it's positive and it's good, then your brains, your neurons in the brain, which fire together, wire together, so it creates a new memory. So we can change their patterns to positive and happy and get rid of the traumas in the past. So if we can change the mindset, like I say, 21 days, but we're going to do it for 12 weeks and after the 12 weeks we'll have accommodation, we'll have a job ready. So a lot of red tape around it, a lot of health and safety. But like I say, I'm a visionary and I'll get this happening and I'll get it done hopefully this year. Brilliant. I mean, you've, you mentioned two people who completely turned their lives mm-hmm. around since the documentary. We've seen Stuart, Stuart eh? on your podcast. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a wee bit about what happened after the documentary with these two? So Stuart, like I say, Street Connect, who do the 12-week programmes for drinking drugs, who, who's run by uh, Julie, Ricky and Julie, who, are, again, who are addicted, had addiction problems. So they've been there and done it. I actually met them doing my documentary. So Stuart, like I say, they got offered help, and then he's been down to Nottingham and uh, got himself clean, and now Stuart's on the street himself. And he's he's doing massive things. I spoke to him last night, and he's he's doing brilliant. And this is a man who felt who, who was suicidal. This is a man who I'm telling you had absolutely nothing. He was full of I was taking forty fifty volume a day, taking crack, taking brown, and uh, like I say, that light bulb moment only takes that that one second can change your life. And he done it, and I'm proud of him. And like I say, it's, anybody can change. It doesn't matter how low you are. And even anybody sitting listening to this, and you think there's there's no hope, man. There's always hope. There's always hope. You just got to believe in yourself and. Take the baby steps. Like I say, you don't need to see the full staircase, but as long as you take that first step, your life can go any way you want. So the way you're feeling it now, it's only you that can change that. And the scary thing is, nobody's coming to save us. So if we're in a bad place, nobody's going to save us. You need to do that shit yourself. And it can be done. Like I say, there's people who've done it. I'm living proof it can be done. And uh, ah, yeah, I'm proud of it. And like I say, that's what keeps me going. But again... I did the documentary, it's done for me. I need to kick on, I, need to ju- I can't just live mm-hmm. on that for 10 years Aye. and 20 years. Aye. I need to, I need to raise the bar again, I need yeah. to keep going. Everything's about progression for me. And I can't say, oh, I've done a documentary 20 years later, I'm sitting in a pub and I'm still talking about it. I've done it, but w- what's the next steps for me? Mm-hmm. Because there's so many people make documentaries, but they don't back it up. I'm backing it up. Do you know what I mean? I, like I say, I can talk all this shit, but actions speak louder than words. And that's exactly what I'm doing, is acting on it. I think it's a great thing that you've done and you've obviously you've made uh, created relationships with various different charities who all do phenomenal work Mm -hmm. for the homeless it's a huge problem but what you do find I walk uh, a distance about a mile from my work to the the bus station and I walk past the same half a dozen rough sleepers uh, people actually lying on the street begging every single day and you think you know if I gave every single one of them a fiver a day Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage mm-hmm. should there be more done by the government because i feel sometimes you know that there is there is this this battle whereby if you're going to your work and you see that it's almost a fear because if you don't tow the party line go to your work pay your bills do mm-hmm. what you're told this this is the this is the other option if you fancy it you know of course i think the government could eradicate it in the uk overnight of course like i say there's more empty houses than there's than there is homeless people there's more empty like spaces, churches. Like I say, the, the church is um, one of the biggest money makers in the world. It's uh, and the government, of course, government can make changes to click a finger. But whether they want to do that or whether they want to depopulise, I don't know. Whether they want pain and torture, a lot of big charities as well. A lot of I've got to remember, a lot of these big charities are making millions, hundreds of millions. So if they clear up homelessness, then a lot of these charities lose money as well. Like I say, for me, it's about, it's, I can point fingers, but I've made changes to people's life. So for me, instead of pointing to the government, then if you want good in the world, be the good yourself. I can create goodness, I can create change, but if there's 10 or 100 people backing me, I believe I can change the world. Like I say, this system isn't just going to work in Glasgow, this system I've got to work worldwide. Everything's a mindset, and of course the government, we can moan and shout at them and say this, but whether they're going to make a change is a different story, because the numbers are rising People are getting skinned, our food banks are rising. Uh, it's a tough time to be a human being, but again, you still got to show gratitude to actually what you have got. And with, like I say, it's a touchy subject, and I get what you're saying walking around the town. Because I do my homeless stuff, I can't speak to everybody because mm-hmm. I've got kids myself, I've got to run businesses, I've got to try and do what I can do. So, But just even that two minutes of time to that one person can change their full day. And like I say, if you're a gift, yeah, you'd be skint, you'd be on the streets, Paul. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, it's a, such a difficult situation. But I think more people are becoming awake to it from social media, which is a good thing. But a lot of people as well post, and it can be a thin line between posting for your own ego or posting for homelessness. Because 
I get it if somebody is listen if you don't want posting about a photo about someone then I get it but a lot of people come out the woodwork in December as well for homelessness who want to help Aye. and do this and do that but your home, homelessness is it just for Christmas or December it's a 24-7 thing but I'm not going to take away from anybody that's going to do a good deed even if you do it once a year then it's a good deed that's better than a bad deed if you know what I mean but again back to the government of course they can click their fingers and make massive changes there's places in like Finland and Canada because their housings they can afford houses they, everything's cheaper so like I say it's too but I'm, I struggle I struggle to get by. Do you know what I mean? I'm doing three or four different things. I'm, mm. I'm struggling. There's people who are at the food banks who've got two jobs that are struggling to buy food. So it's not it's, it's not just about homeless people. It's about the whole the whole system. The system's failing. Mm-hmm. And it's as simple as that. And you see all these politicians, you just look at the state of them. They're so old. They're so grey. Why would you take orders from somebody who doesn't even look good themselves? Do you know what I mean? You've got to take full responsibility of your actions because to be free, I believe... Don't listen to anybody else. It comes within for yourself, and it's difficult. Like I say, the government, they're always going to be that. In my opinion, it's corrupt. Mm-hmm. It's so corrupt and, and so polluted, and it's the greed's poisoned men's souls. And I, I, I do think the week of the Brexit vote, anybody who's had any faith in their political system whatsoever, mm-hmm. it's surely gone. Yeah. It's, it's a joke. We were talking, Kevin, about football clubs as community clubs. Uh, some call them community clubs, some don't. Some realise they're just big business, and... Hibs over Christmas, going back to Hibs at your former club, mm-hmm. uh, opened the doors to over 200 people who were poverty stricken, be that homeless, unemployed, who might not have had a Christmas dinner that mm-hmm. day. And Leanne Dempster made the decision that they were going to feed these people. I think there was 230 Probably. on the day they came in, they had their meal. Mm-hmm. There's that sense of community. They might not even support Hibs, mm-hmm. you know, but football stadiums all over the country have got the facilities and the means to do that. Do you think sometimes because, you know, the government is a, a massive a massive issue that, you know, we could talk all day about what they're not doing, etc. Mm-hmm. Do you think sometimes the football clubs could open their doors definitely. and give shower facilities, etc.? I definitely, but if I, like I say, I could go back to churches, chapels, these places are lying empty as well. And I think Crystal Palace did it today. They opened their doors for homelessness because the temperatures have dropped. There's a, there's a young lady died in Paisley there yesterday, alone. When I did my documentary, I found a 19, there was a 19-year-old boy down the lane dead. So this is the society, and this is the things we don't see in the mainstream media or no print us either, because it makes people aware. There's over 7 billion people in this world, but we're controlled with, with fear. We're, no scared, we're, we're too scared to stand up and make a... And make, just go and stand up for your rights. We're, we're too scared. We're caught up in a rat race where we're too scared to speak out in case what people, the, the radicules or the, 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 the bad mouthers or the portrayers is this character. So be it. But it's such a it's difficult subject. It's, it's, it is. It's t- so touchy. Like, there's so many things people can do. But it's uh, for me, it's just about doing what you can do as an individual because we can point fingers and, like I say, with the football stadiums, they should be opening the doors. And there's people in mansions where... 20 bedrooms like I say there's people in the street dying that's somebody's son and like I say it's humanity is failing and as we evolve so much that we're going backwards now that we forget what's really important mm-hmm. as a human being I believe no matter how much goodness you bring into the world no matter how many material possessions you have or how much money you have the real goodness you do in this world is how much goodness you actually do to another person or make another human being feel for my opinion that's the best currency and that's something I'm still trying to work on like I say all the homeless stuff that I do it makes me feel good Paul it makes me feel good that other people are getting rewarded from it and that's a buzz that happened. and I've took many drugs to find that buzz and for me, helping others is the buzz that I crave. Great, great buzz. And the thing as well, James, your your podcast continues. Mm-hmm. I know you've got Brad Welsh coming on. Bradley, aye. Fantastic guest. Great guy. What else, what other plans have you got for the pod in the, in the future? But like I say, just, the, the guests are coming thick and fast. Now people are messaging me to come on. I want to turn it into a chat show, which I believe I'll do a more chat show kind of thing. I don't even know if mine's as a podcast, Paul. There's no many, I don't know. It feels weird, I think I'm turning into a chat show more like, um, like I said, for me, I've, I've kind of broken into the Glasgow scene, it's kind of known now, not known enough, like I say, but I want to venture in England to get a couple of English guests, and then it'll be doors of open, I want to travel the world with it, and like I say, I want to be number one in the UK, and I believe I will be, I believe I will be in the next 18 months, I believe, like I say, there's people out there who are do amazing with it, but I believe in my talent and I believe in my gift that I can make people open up. I make people present their best self to me. That's something I don't know if that's where the gambling. I've always made people feel good. 
because if I was gambling and I had no money, I'd come to your door and make you feel good, make you laugh, make you, and then before you left, I would have to hit you for 50 quid or 100 quid, but because I'd made you feel so good, you know you weren't getting that money back, but because you oh, here, there you go. It was always, I had that, I just had, always, had, I don't know what it is, maybe a bit of two-facedness as well, because I, I but I'm just good at, I, I enjoy what I do, and like I say, I'm versatile, I can sit with anybody, and I love people's stories, I show empathy, which is, I think is most important to show, because like I say, there's a lot of hard-hitting stories, and to show a bit of empathy, I think that's important, but like I say, I want to travel the world with it. Mm-hmm. It's a couple of your guests, Tommy Sheridan and Chris McQueer mm-hmm. play with you for the, the Celtic All Boys who are called the Celtic Greats. Mm-hmm. How did you get involved in that and what do you expect to see when you go to one of these games? If you're somebody who hasn't been to one of these games and by the way they are very mm-hmm. supportive of local charities and food banks. Mm-hmm. It's a Celtic old Crocs game against the Rangers one but it's getting to the stage where it's quite competitive, isn't it? Now it is. You, you're going to be competitive as soon as you put that hoop on. You want to win, man. Especially when it's against Rangers. I don't care who you are. And listen, I can talk all this spiritual crap, but nay, you see that red, white and blue, man. It's You're charging. Do you know what I mean? Let's face it. and It's just the way it is. And When people come to these games, you're going to see fun. You're going to see a lot of friendly faces. Let's like say Tommy Shea, a great guy, Chris McQueer, who's going to be absolutely massive. But I believe in synchronicity. And all, all, all of us have come into each other's life for a reason. Do you know what I mean? And that's the way it is. And to get offered to play in these games is unbelievable. For a boy for post, so it's had absolutely nothing to. But rubbing shoulders with people that's played at Parkhead is is, is something like that, I think. Is this real? Because even though we do it, it doesn't feel real because we're doing it. Including your, yourself with your, your show, Paul. It's, it's uh, the award and that. You, it probably, even though you're doing it, doesn't feel real because you are doing it. But what you are doing is unbelievable as well. You have created something. Again, we, everything start, what people need to understand, everything starts with a vision. Yeah. Everything starts with one thought, that light bulb moment, even everything that's created in this universe and now. The human beings could have created that a thousand years ago. It's just to have that light bulb moment to do it, which we've done and created. But listen, get involved. Old Bernie, a uh, great guy, and for what he's doing, is brilliant. But like I say, man, we're there to win, and that's never going to go away. It's a great insight because you're sitting in a changing room, Kevin, with... Frank McGarvey's your manager. Who's a nutcase? Let's face it. <laughs> he gives you a team talk. He, he gives you a team talk, which usually results in nobody knowing where they're, you're playing. Mm-hmm. Right? Nobody knows their position. Sometimes he sends sends you, and then you're saying I'm playing left back, and somebody else says no, I'm playing left back. At one on one occasion, we had twelve players right? mm-hmm. <laughs> going out to play. His assistant one time was Jim Craig. So you've got all of this happening in the background, and you've got people like Simon Donnelly, Rudy Vata. Tommy Sheridan milling about Be Des it's Clark a, Des Clark it, It's a fantastic situation to be in And it's a great opportunity to play in it And then you're in a Celtic huddle Which is the captain Simon Donnelly Who's been in a genuine Celtic huddle mm-hmm. many times So he gives you the team talk You're actually there I'll not tell you what he says But he gives you the team talk in the huddle that, That's one thing it should never be it revealed It should never leave it the huddle You're right never you're be absolutely revealed. Right. But I love it And God knows why I'm there But I love it you know, I'm not going to say no, am I? So it's fantastic to be involved in that. And as you say, there is, there's a group of people who we had Chris on uh, the podcast as well and we would support him to the help. There, there's going to be a time where we won't be able to get Chris, mm-hmm. probably in the not too distant future because mm-hmm. his career it's is going to fly. Definitely. And there is a group of really good people who will help. It's like what you say, there's a lot of good in, in folk that, who will assist you when, when required. But what you're doing, what you're doing, James... You know, I would just say anybody that listens to us, give it a shot if you've never listened to your show. Mm-hmm. Some of my personal favourites, Blink McDonald was brilliant. I mean, you're engrossed. It's like mm-hmm. his life story, you're mm-hmm. engrossed in it. And many, many times during that, you're thinking, how does he get out of this? How can he not be a criminal? I know, I know. And that's the difficulty as well. It's like the homeless thing. How do you get out of that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the interesting thing. The dominatrix, I just laughed all the way through it. Andy McLaren, Georgie Lyle, is she a Celtic fan? She is. Yeah, we've never had a porn star on There yet. you go then, I can set that up, not a problem. <laughs> we've had Frank McAvaney on. <laughs> He's probably bigger than her, if I'm honest. <laughs> That's as close as it gets. When you're playing these great games, the Celtic greats, when you were younger and possible, who did you want to be? I love Big Paul Elliott, if I'm honest. So I did. I, that was that was my idol. I, I don't know why, I just loved him as a player. Because he had a that. season ticket in Victoria's. I probably, I probably. That's how I probably, a big man liked to party. No, I just... I, I just thought he was a player. He was class. Maybe. He was aye, class. He was, and it was at a time where we didn't have many class players. Mm-hmm. No, Elliot came in. Like, he looked good. He was just nah, brilliant. He, he stood out like a surfer, mate. He did. In that team, anyway. 
but he, he was good. He was decent. He went down to Chelsea. Aye. He done he done well at Chelsea. He was fantastic in Italy. He was an England he, B captain. I think when he went to Chelsea, had it not been for that injury, aye. he probably would have uh, represented England. He didn't go to the most defensive football in the world and be a success if mm-hmm. you can't defend. Definitely. And 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 he was and he was fantastic. No, I just that's a, a name you don't really hear about, but that's who I can always remember in the old jungle, and that's who. Big Paul, man, he just what a player. He just he just danced in the park. He just fit. Just I know, Big Paul. I, I, that was my first ever idol. But then obviously when Lubo and that came and Aye. guys like that, bit of, bit of magic, then you go right wait a minute. Then <laughs> that changes. But uh, no, there's been a few. But Big Paul was my very first. Are you enjoying it at the moment as a Celtic fan? I mean, we are in a situation where we've won seven domestic mm-hmm. trophies in a row, and we're finding obviously issues to discuss and, and moan about. But the truth of the matter is, it's great being a Celtic fan. Oh, it's the best. This is the best time in the 34 years I've been on this planet to be a Celtic fan because. But what happens is we're getting greedy. Let's face it, we've not had a challenge in seven or eight years. Now, I don't even believe there is a challenge, if I'm honest, but I just think Celtic have slipped. I just think. But the signings there, I think it's just going to turn again. I think Celtic will kick off. Celtic's only in first gear. Celtic will get an R2 three gears, and I think it'll be game on again. But I think this is what Celtic need. This is what they need because, let's face it, Gerard. It'll be his first season, and he's only going to improve. That guy's a winner. It's as simple as that. But I think Celtic will improve. I like the big boy Buck, and the boy Weir looks good. I just think Celtic will kick on, definitely. It's uh, But it's, it's helpful for the league. And I don't think, like I say, Celtic could have went a wee step back, but I think the managers have improved. It's not, You're not going to go and coast uh, each right. game because Kilmarnock's looks improved, Aberdeen's he's improved. Got, Clark's so a manager, but I heard Clark's actually waiting for the Celtic job as well in a couple of years. He's a Celtic man, Clark. But I would I would be happy with him and Ox. He's a great manager. He's mm-hmm. a he's 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 worked he, for the he, best. He didn't hang about Chelsea, Liverpool mm-hmm. for as long as he did. Definitely. There's a Steve Clark Sweet doing at Stamford Bridge. Steve oh, Clark Sweet. You know that he's well thought of. Obviously, he had a great career with as Mourinho. a player and then as as a coach and assistant mm-hmm. manager. I think you know. Everything you've spoke about today, James, has been fantastic. If anybody who listens to our show hasn't checked out Anything Goes By James English, go and watch it. Go and watch the Homeless documentary. Follow him on Twitter. You're active on Twitter. You respond to people's messages. And all we can say from this end is thank you very much for being on A Celtic State of Mind. And thanks for having us, guys. I really appreciate it. And what you've done is, like I say, you've got a great show. And this is only the start for you as I know as well. So, yeah, it's good, man. Thanks Absolute for having pleasure. us, guys. Thanks, thanks very much, James. Perfect. Perfect. Cheers. Cheers. A Celtic State of Mind can be found at axom.net. We're sponsored by Fansbet, the betting company by fans for fans. 